Do not adjust your digital device. What you are about to see and hear may shock and appall you. Join our hosts as they encounter countless thrills, spills, chills, and hilarity as they explore the very weirdest in pop culture. The following media is so strange, so beyond the scope of what is normal, it will make you ask the question, why does this exist? Everybody and welcome to another episode of Why Does This Exist? I'm Chris. I'm Rob. And today we've got a wonderful little TV show to talk about. Uh, the uh, The audience is very skewed. Where um, th this is not necessarily a I love it or hate it. This is more of I love this or I have never heard of this or seen this at all. So we are at two different mediums, and if you've seen it, you will fall in love with this show. Uh, we're talking about. A wild green guy living under the bed. He'll gobble up a sock before you turn your head. Like a bolt of lightning, he'll make your heart jump. And his name is Mr. Bumpy. He goes, bump, bump, bump. Uh, he goes 100 miles an hour, and he's green dynamite. And his name is Mr. Bumpy, and he goes, bump in the night. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an extraordinarily beautiful little um, wacky, weird Saturday morning cartoon that aired in uh, 1994. And um, it actually... It actually was um, airing in some capacity, or at least the characters were um, were airing in some capacity about a year before that. But we will get into that in a moment. We are Why Does This Exist? We are a podcast that speaks about the very weirdest in all of pop culture, whether or not it is a TV show like we are about to explore, uh, or a uh, a weird video game that makes no sense, which we might, which we're going to chat a little bit about uh, the uh, the animation studio, uh, stop motion animation studio, what you like, whatever you'd like to call it, uh, had a hand in designing a uh, a game of some sorts, and one of the creators of that, of, of this show has actually had a hand in many a video game, actually, of a, of a little blue guy who well runs around and now has his own movies. Um, but we we talk about either those things, a, a wacky movie, a strange product, or an interesting product such as Legos that have uh, just kind of taken the world by storm, or we're just a popcorn fart in church. There is nothing that's too taboo. There is something – well, actually, there are a couple of things that are a little taboo, but uh, we will not be talking about that. Um, we – also talk about very weird TV shows like this one and uh, and, and John Dillerman, which is another strange one. I said that already. Uh, or any other things of that nature in pop culture that makes absolutely no sense. Probably shouldn't exist, but it does. So we're here to answer that question for you. And it's really just talk about weird things or like just music, such as a Weird Al, which we uh, mentioned a couple of weeks ago. Giving him two episodes, one of his own movie and one of his uh, his masterful, masterful work. Uh, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts uh, at our lovely new home on Spreaker, which we've been on there a month now, and we've already made a dollar. So that already tells you how horrible our previous home was. Uh, and if you know who that is, you should never, ever go there. Um, I, I do not recommend them. The people at Capital One have kind of bent over. So now we've got a whole thing to deal with. And uh, it's 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 a mess. I really I, I really hate our old home's guts, but I'm glad that we've moved to a sunny utopian paradise as opposed to a, a rundown shack that we used to exist in. Um, we're also on YouTube, where we strongly encourage that you like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Why does this exist? With a question mark. And um, if you want to leave your feedback, that's what we want in a comment. You could tell us that we're a horrible show and what we need to do better, and we will try to do that. Everything, or you could tell us that we're amazing and what you love about the show, and we'll try to do more of that. 
everything helps fuel the channel and makes uh, and makes the show a better show. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, Pandora, TuneIn, Alexa, iHeartRadio, Player FM, Listen Notes, and Stitcher. And we are already pending to be added onto other podcasting platforms when we're officially on them. I will let you know and I will update this, but we appreciate each and every one of you. Um, you can find us on social media. You can find us on Twitter. That's twitter.com slash YWDTE pod. You can also like us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash why does this exist pod. And if you want to give us our, your feedback in private, then you can, or if you want to leave us a tip or give us an episode idea, you can do that by uh, emailing us at why does this exist show at gmail.com. Or if you just, you know, want us to talk about something and you've got a topic that you think is interesting, give us a mailbag and, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll answer you. We'll try to answer your questions as best that we can on the air. Um, you can also find some extra little goodies at why does this exist pod.com. We have some articles that are coming out all the time. Um, we are, we've got one um, that uh, our panel and writer Tony recently wrote last week about uh, about the band Ween. We have a we have a sequel article coming up to that where he actually details his experience in seeing Ween live and what that was like. So that should be up by the time this podcast has been into the uh, launched into the stratosphere. So we greatly appreciate each and every one of you. And if you want to support us in another medium. Physically, by giving us real money in real time. I know we just said that we made a dollar. That's from ad revenue from the good folks over at Spreaker. But if you want to give us a little bit extra, that we would greatly appreciate that. We can help pay a few people and keep the lights on. And that would be just fantastic all around. I mean, for God's sakes, Rob's got six kids. He's got six. That's a lie. He's got six kids. No, that's, really that's a lie. <laughs> Yeah, all right, it's, I, I did lie. He's got 12 kids. The man has 12 children and his poor wife. The only time she's ever been on vacation is in the is in the uh, emergency room. It's like, this woman needs a day to the spa. And so does Rob and so do all of his children. Send them over to Legoland. You can support the show that way by heading on over to our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash why does this exist? So if you, wa- you want to open up the little kindness chest in your heart, that's a chest within a chest that helps spread love and joy to the world and doing it through the through, through by by fueling our corporate greed machine. You could do that by heading over to Patreon. All you need to do is just give us a dollar. We have a bunch of other rewards on there, but all you have to do if you could just find it in the uh, in the kindness of your wallet, you can head on over to Patreon, give us a dollar. We'll we'll let you into the Discord server and you can talk to us. You can tell us how stupid we are to our faces. Wouldn't that be a gander? Yeah. Sounds like a deal to me. All right, let's get on with the. All right, so let's let's let's, let's get on with it. But uh, you so before so so he, that's the news. Here's the weather. You are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge from a ragtag group of rogues. Let's get on with the goddamn show. Bump in the night. <laughs> Bump in this the night. Some, He's Mr. Bumpy. This had a collection of characters. This is Toy Story before Toy Story, essentially. It's actually like almost like Monsters, Inc. beats Toy Story. Yes, and I mean, you could see some comparisons between Squishington and Mr. Bumpy. Uh, Mr. Bumpy, yeah. you could like in you could get you could totally see the idea for um, for Mike Wazowski. Just come yeah. out of his character design in Squishington, him just being the big, you know, blue gentle fellow, potentially is the idea for uh, for Sully. But we've also got you know Toy Story in that the toys are sent is in that the toys and the objects that are in the um, on the show they they're all sentient and they're alive, but they don't allow yeah. themselves to be seen by the children and the children. We hilariously, and, and or adults, we never see their faces, kind of like the nanny um, character in Muppet Babies. Oh, yeah. But it's just an interesting and fun show that was way ahead of its time in terms of a lot of the, uh, a lot of the messaging that was going on and also in, in the storytelling, but also 
they did a really good job in the world building of this place and on top of that they um they really like it was just very far ahead of its time as a show in general i think they could definitely bring it back today and a lot of people would be really happy about it actually yeah um like the uh one of the co-creators um ken pontak as uh, as mentioned in an interview that i was listening to on a podcast the other day the uh, the mr tv show um i don't know if he's still doing episodes but he had a very in his first two episodes were these very in-depth interviews with um with ken pontak and the um and the uh and the other co-creator um i forget the the gentleman's name david um i want to say it's david io Take or something of that nature. David Blyman. David Blyman. Yes, Blyman. David, David Blyman is, is is his current name. Um, on the original, uh, on, on the original credits, it's like something with an I, and I'm not sure why. Huh. I'm sure, if that was a stage name or if um maybe, or if he just. You mean his alias? Oh, yeah, David Blyman. Ichi- David Blyman Ichioka. Oh. So apparently, it's according to guess, IMDb. Okay, so I guess he's used both of his names. Yeah. Thing. So we're gonna come off unprepared in that motion, and someone's gonna ding us for it. But that's okay. Oh, he he also worked on Clay Fighter and the PJs. Oh no way! Yeah, he was a producer on the PJs, and he worked. He was a director of of Clay Fighter, the video game. Oh, that's amazing! I didn't. I, I knew that the studio was involved in what uh, was the studio that created Clay Fighter. I didn't know that they. Yeah. Were, I didn't know that they worked on. Um, I didn't know that they worked on the PJs as well, which we've also talked about on yes. the show as the lost episode. Yeah, and Ke- so Ken Pontak, who who was the writer, um, he or he oh, he was the director, and he, and I think the writer. Uh, he was yes. the creator. He was one of the creators. Ken Pontak. Anyway, he also worked on Clay Fighter, the Clay Fighter video games, as well as Primal Rage. Uh, Mad World and a, a bunch of different Sonic the Hedgehog games. So he's actually done a lot. He's and he's worked on comic books also, apparently. Yeah. Um, and he's done a number of television shows. Uh, he, he's worked on uh, uh, Curious George, uh, Woody the Woodpecker. Like the, these are like the newer versions of those. He worked uh, on Arthur helped, for a few years. He said that his yeah. favorite show. Um, besides, he worked on besides Lazy the- Town and Mucha Lucha. I'm sorry. Right. He, no, he said that his favorite. Um, he said that his favorite show to work on, with the except uh, other than Bump in the Night, was uh, Happy Tree Friends, just because of how much creative freedom that they. Oh yeah. That they had. Excuse me, I'm a little gassy today. Um, he, uh, he, but he said that it's been like his one of his favorite projects to work on because they could be as they could be as diabolical as they possibly oh, could. Yeah, I mean, Happy Tree Friends was pretty If you've ever seen brutal. it, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, yeah, it was brutal. that they followed were, or tried to follow it to their best were rules that they that the creative team had set up. Um, they, they didn't have any censors, which was a big issue with Bump of the Night, actually. Um, there was a particular there was a particular woman who uh, in a, um, I believe in a Happy Tree Friends episode, they wrote her, they, they wrote like, um, they wrote a character that was like a, a caricature of her that had yeah. the same initials. And, um, her name was Mary, uh, ah, gosh, what was her name? Mary, Mary something or other. It's on the tip of my tongue. But he had a problem, he had a problem with this, uh, <laughs> with, with, um, one of these sensors at uh, the um, broadcast standards and practices, or uh, the uh, BS and P, and they just constantly had um, they constantly were going back and forth over little things that he had made a um, he actually made a whole like document of every single thing that they've that that they like told them to change or vetoed, and like it worked like some things. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. Maybe you don't make a joke about Lyme disease or something like that. But um, there were others where it was like, they, I don't know, like they said, um, like maybe they threw a pen at somebody and it hit them in the eye and they were like, no, you can't do that because it encourages throwing, it encourages 
like throwing pens at people or something like oh my that. God. Like something absolutely absurd that they would just say no. Like one of them, uh, here we go. There was like, there was one where it was like, um, please delete the steam coming from the boiling lobster pot, citing hot steam as an act of interpersonal violence unsuitable for children. Uh, we're evaluating the line get bent to determine if the expression has a hidden slang meeting that would not be acceptable for Saturday morning broadcast. Please delete the phrase, you're so stupid. We wish to avoid negative IQ references. This is um, this is directly from an interview with, uh, with Ken Pontac of just like ridiculous things. So anyway, he had put this into a, he had just constantly, he had, every time they got something, he made this ridiculously oversized document that he that like eventually got posted in Vanity Fair and it got published in another paper and it like got around to a lot of places and I, it was it was called something like um things things you have it's like it, it was just like the no paper it was like things it was called like things you can't say or something like that yeah and it's just gotten around through like count through like research papers and things like that of just ridiculous things with censorship. So it, it's like, that goes to show you just how uptight the, like, whoever the network censor people are, like, just how uptight you have to be to have that job, or like, you're just scrutinizing everything under the most absurd microscope, microscope that you could possibly have. Yeah. And you're just like picking it apart for something that isn't there. And you're really digging at straws. So at, eventually, um, David, like, there was like a gag that, um, that Ken Pontac was like writing in and, um, and he knew that it was so ridiculous that BSMP was going to cut it. So he just said to David, he was like, I wrote and he was like, listen, you think I should just take this out because they're going to cut it anyway? And then David Blyman was like, no, 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 no. You leave the damn gag in. It's your job to write it. It's their job to cut it out. So that was the lesson that he like never forgot. And he, and he kept that for the ra for like the rest of his career. I mean, obviously when he was writing for like children with like Arthur and lazy town, um, Ken Pontac, obviously, couldn't go over the top with anything mm -hmm. with a certain th with most things. So, yeah, like all right, like I like he knew where to pull back, but when he didn't have anywhere to pull, when he didn't have to pull back, he didn't. And you shouldn't if you're writing a TV show right now, you shouldn't be afraid of like what some idiot with a blog or somebody who just doesn't have a sense of humor is gonna like say about it or whatever the or whatever the maniacs on Twitter are gonna like do about it. Or any yeah. actual real life sensors that work at like the broadcast standards and practices, like that are real network sensors that actually control what happens to you, as opposed to like, oh, I, what, I, I hope that people on Twitter don't get upset. Well, I, I, I know a lot of the times now, like what happens, what like what writers will do, you know, or like it's been done in the past and they still do it. I think is is basically. You know, if they want some, like a particular joke or a particular scene in that like might be a little too like might not make it past the censors, they'll write or like or or film like an even more extreme scene so that one like gets cut and they'll keep the other one in. You know, right? And half the time, the more extreme scene ends up the one that they yeah. intended to be cut ends up making it. Yeah, which is the fucking hilarious to me. Makes no sense, but that's but I digress. So if you're a TV writer right now listening to this show for some god no for some godforsaken reason, then if you're worried about writing a joke or like leaving it a gag or wondering, oh, who's like I hope no, but I hope that people don't take this the wrong way. Just write it. It'll be it's good for your soul. Just yeah. get out there. And what and whatever the hell happens happens, and then just leave it. Let, let somebody else deal with it because it's their if, if it's their job to cut it. And like you know, you just stand for what you believe in and put it in there. That's my advice to anybody writing TV. Maybe it's not the best advice, but it's my advice. And for, and if you're one of three people that's listening to this right now, then good for you. We already know who the two people are that constantly listen to this show every week are. And it's not our significant others. <laughs>
But if you're that third person, good for you. Do that. Take the, take take my advice. Don't take my advice. But I but just you know do what you got to do. Just don't use it for ill will or harm or anything bad. As long as your heart's in the right place and you're doing, and then like go right ahead. But if your heart's in a bad place, then don't take my advice. I'm I, I don't want to be responsible for your mistake. Anyway, um, bump in the night was uh was, was so like st- bump in the night being also a uniquely stop motion animation show which uh you don't really see a whole lot before there's a bit, there, there, there's a resurgent in recent years as we mentioned with uh with ro- on the robot chicken episode but the reason that bump in the night and uh, and you saw a lot of stop motion animation in the um in the early to mid 90s it was because of the success of the nightmare before christmas and the, yeah. and once that became a big hit, animation studios and and um, and and television companies were just ordering kid shows that were stop motion left and right. So anybody yeah. who came in, and the, an- the animation was re- really fucking good on on this show too. It oh, was like yeah. really smooth and like you know a lot of like kids stop motion shows like Gumby and stuff like that. If you look back were like not really that good animation like because obviously it was they you know figured it's a kid's show kids don't really give a crap like they'll just watch it anyway but bump in the night had like a really had really good smooth animation almost to the point where it was like uh, there's some scenes that you would think oh it's got to be computer generated because of how smooth it is but it's not it's actually stop motion right and it, i just thought that that was extremely interesting because the, like, the, the animation is so fluid on this that like yeah it's like it's like well, for, well, I mean, it, it's like they took the words of the voice actors and then they anim- and then they animated around which they do a lot in regular animation, but yeah, it's, but that's more of a practice now, and I don't know if that was really the case in nineteen ninety three or four, um, especially with stop motion. I don't know if stop motion was really working like that because it's a very expensive expensive and it's time consuming so. yes and very time consuming so they could so like they could have done it the traditional way where they didn't have time or money to like reanimate anything so it's but it's flawless of how, yeah. of how animated bumpy and squishington are and um, and as well as molly and all of the other characters they really move with this with this like they're, they're very loose and stop yeah. is normally not as loose as this or fluid. So it's almost like it's almost like watching a rubber hose animation like come into like the real world. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Um and it really it really gives these characters a whole lot a whole nother dimension. But um Ken Pontek the, the Ken Pontek had started his um his career just really like just going Onto um onto just doing commercials and uh, and like one off spots for like Coca Cola and Disneyland and Shell Oil and like other things and he created some feature effects for Never Say Never Again and Moonstruck and um I was listening to an interview to uh, the Mr TV interview and him and um him and David Blyman actually go all the way back to like to like the seventh grade like they've been like best friends forever basically. Oh wow! Or like yeah, like they were both worked on the um, they both worked on like the high school news, um, the, the high school newspaper, and they like did all this other stuff, and they were like living together. And they like were doing drugs, and they saw Eraserhead, and um, oh, God, <laughs> they saw Eraserhead, and they did another, uh, and then they saw and um, they saw another um, movie that um, they saw another stop motion movie that this fellow made, and I the, the name is the name is escaping me, and I apologize for that. And um, but they saw it, and they were, and it was like stop motion. It was a, it was like a cartoon or something that they showed before Eraserhead, and they were like, "Oh my god! Like we need to do this. I want to do this type of animation." So mm-hmm. they so like they ended up. Um, I think they ended up meeting the guy. And like he bite and like they spoke with him and they like had a whole like connection and whatever. And the next thing I knew, they like he was where um, Ken Pontek was the art director for the New Adventures of Gumby, and that's yeah. he was producing the sets and the and, and the puppets and the artwork. And he, you know, and he shortly after 
went to Hollywood in 89, tried to do a TV pilot that aired on ABC TV. Um, and then um, a year after a year on the Warner Brothers lot, he created Danger Productions, which they did pretty well. And that's actually where they ended up doing the Clay Fighter games and other th- and countless other things. Um, they may have, I think they were also involved in the uh, California Raisins commercials, where if you can remember that, Oh God! Yeah, animation and like you know, they did these wacky, like they were like a, um, they were almost like a barbershop soul band, what like R and B band, and they were just raisins. And then they even had like a Michael Jackson raisin show up at one point. It was really bizarre if you know that stuff. But they like, but they did it, and I don't know if they really even had to license Michael Jackson's image at the time or not. Maybe they did, like they maybe they did, but. In those days, things were a lot more loose, so maybe they didn't. I don't really know, um, but it's just kind of cool that they were able to do that. And then um, Bump in the Night actually had like come into it. Like Bump in the Night actually had gotten greenlit fairly easy uh, because there was um, there was a woman who um, who absolutely fell in love with um with the show like she, like not even the show she just he had um he had the, like her name is uh Jenny Trias uh she was the VP of children's programming at ABC but he just he had created the character he had just like created a stop he had just created like a model of Mr. Bumpy yeah and he like brought it in to like it's the show base. Like he just brought it in and he like showed her the thing. And he was like, this is the character that like we were thinking of doing. He likes to like, you know, he likes to eat socks and he does this weird thing and everything. And she was like, she fell in love with the character immediately. And she just ordered the show. She was just like, no, we're doing this. She's like, I'm putting you in touch with people and they're going to get this done. And we're making this show. And he was uh-huh. like, holy crap. And, and then, then that's, and then he had like, asked, um, like, he had then asked Blyman to just, like, pitch the show and, like, boot and, like, do everything that he could to just get the bill to go, to, like, go for, like, Saturday morning and and everything. And, like, he had brought him aboard because, you know, he needed a right-hand man because Hollywood is the Hollywood. We're, like, the moment that you, like, you can't leave the room during a board meeting when you're pitching something or you're talking about a show because... You know, because, like, Hollywood is just such a cutthroat place where the minute that you, like, get up to go to the bathroom, everyone's just going to tar- just gonna start talking trash about you and then yeah. bury you to the whole rest of the board. And then when you come back, everybody's going to, like, tighten back up and pretend that nothing happened and that they don't, like, secretly despise you and they're not ready to stab you in the back at a moment's notice. Yeah. He had Blyman next to him so that the two of them, because the two of them were so close that they shared a symbiotic relationship. Of just, and they had watched, they had like, you know, just from like, just from like hanging out all those years and just religiously watching um, old Looney Tunes cartoons to the point where they memorized them. They kind of like could like, they, they could fit it, they could recite entire shows back and like entire like cartoons back and forth because they uh-huh. watched them so much and they studied the animation styles and everything so much. That he needed that that he needed somebody who he could trust in that room with him, so that that way, like, yeah, and that that way the two of them could just look at each other if like they were meeting with somebody and they and like their BS alarms like went off, they could look at each other and just say, yeah, this guy's full of shit, and then like and and without saying a word, and then they knew they wouldn't go with that person, yeah, like you know that's that's a very special bond that everybody needs to have in their life with somebody. Yeah. Um, Especially if you're in that kind of cutthroat business that it's good to have like a fucking wingman that's always there that can, you know, watch your back and shit like that. Oh, absolutely. Um, and they ended up, and so they got the show and, uh, and the, uh, so our, our, our main characters are obviously Mr. Bumpy, who is a, uh, who is a green and, um, who is a green, a monster that lives under the bed. Uh, he's got a couple of purple spots, and um, and then you have um, 
the blue squ- you had the, the blue fellow Squishington, who is like a little um, he's like he's not water. He's just like he lives in the bathroom and he like just comes out of he like lives in the toilet basically. In the, he's in the toilet cistern, like the top part of the toilet. Yeah, he, he lived. yeah. So he's a bunch of like he's a combination of a bunch of different like toilet fluids. Then that have just like come to life, and uh, and then you have um you have Molly Coddle, who is this Raggedy Ann doll who has just been loved, so, like by the children. She's a comfort doll, and she's been loved to, like to the by children so much that like parts of her body like just fall off, and she's replaced them with like just like Frankenstein parts from other from other toys, um, and she has to it's like. And, like, she's trying to, like, actively, like, be the voice of reason and comfort everybody and make them feel special. Like, there's a whole episode where she's dedicating it, where she's, like, trying to make every single toy feel special and feel good and feel loved because that's her job. And she doesn't, but the whole time she's, like, she's not giving herself any time. Like to her, like just to relax and everything. So like she really has like very like maternal instincts, and it's like it's it's really it's really amazing to see how she takes care of all these different characters on the show, and like even and there's like one episode where she eventually gets stressed out from you know from her um from her arms falling off and and everything that she goes and she like she takes um she she like modify she like take does modifications to herself uh where she um where she to like make herself tougher and she's like using parts from another uh from one of the secondary characters this uh this robot um called uh destructo who is um who is more of like i guess you would say like the police like, like, like the authority figure on the show because he doesn't really like mr bumpy too much because he breaks rules all the time but mm-hmm. He actually has like a huge crush on um, on on Molly because she's so you know nice and like and like well intentioned, but she borrows like parts from him, and she ends up revealing how stressed out she actually is, and she's like almost like kind of like you know she gets ticked off pretty easily, so it shows how stressed out she is, and that she's you know that she never really d- spent any time just like. Nobody like she, while she's comforting everybody, no one's there to comfort her. Yeah, she needed and like she didn't realize how badly she just needs, like just to be comforted essentially. Um, but there's a lot of dynamics of the characters. Um, like yeah, Tin is very much you know he's very insecure and you know he he's, he's he doesn't have a he's not very confident and he needs a boost every once in a while. He's not like very depressed, but he gets sad and yeah. she's very unsure of himself. And, but, he's also very uh, like subdued compared to Mister Bumpy, who's kind of like wild and and and, and, and like crazy. Yeah, uh, you know uh, why. Also, I you know we should mention that uh, both Mister Bumpington and Squishington are voiced by Jim Cummings and Rob Paulson, respectively. Yes. Who I you know that's what I was building up to, but yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> they just you know, had a legendary voiceover cast. Which yeah, and I think you had mentioned this is like one of the first times that they had worked together. Yeah, that you had mentioned it well, off the show. Off, yeah. We were off air when we talked about it. Yes, they had previously worked together on a. Um, I don't know how many. Uh, this was one of the first shows, so I don't know exactly which one, but it was at least in the top in the first five shows that mm-hmm. they worked together on. Um, they had previously worked on another show called Mighty Max, where. Um, oh, I remember. I, actually, I remember the Mighty Max toys. I vaguely remember the toys. I don't think I ever watched the show, but Ken Pontak has, act- has actually written for that show too. So before oh, wow. he knew Jim Cummings or Rob Paulson, he had like he had given he had he had written lines for them that the two of them had remembered, but writing. So like, so like when he did eventually meet the two of them, they like he had mentioned like they I, I guess it was one of those conversations where it was like oh well what else did you do uh, oh I did a show I wrote a show called Mighty Max and he was like oh I was on this show really yeah Who are you oh well I was this person no way I wrote I, I wrote for you that's yeah. a thing so glad to meet you like one of those things probably 
Um, which they, which like they already knew that, um, like the uh, whoever the casting director was already knew that, um, that Jim Cummings and Rob Paulson were already the guys to be yeah. Bumpy and Squishington, and he was just like, and, and he just let the other ones audition because he, um, was like they did like a week of auditions and everything and going through it, but like, um, but, um, Jim Cummings had shown up and he like, he like did something very close to it. And he was like, Hey, if you could just give me like 10% more Tom Waits, then like, mm-hmm. I think we've got it. So he just did it because Jim Cummings is amazing. And yeah. that's where you get the bumpy voice. And then Rob Paulson just seamlessly was already squishing tin. So it, yes, the two of them like were already riffing on each other. They have like a symbiotic relationship too. Like on yeah. a lot of the songs, the ad libbing, the ad libbing is just right there, and they like a lot of the lines were just ad libbed, and they just played off of each other, and they just kept the dialogue going. I mean, yeah. both probably some of the most talented and uh, and and most decorated voice actors of all time. Say yes, probably Mel Blanc and have been a handful of others like Dawes Butler and um and you know I would say possibly even Nancy Cartwright at this point. But yeah, just I mean, I mean, like if you've if you've watched any animated film of the last thirty or so years, you've heard both of these people. Yes, both they've Jim been, Cummings and Rob Paulson. They're that prolific. They've, yes, you know, for anybody, listen to, any but for like any like they they they're the voices of the millennial childhood. I would say yes, yeah. Any Disney movie, a classic Disney animated movie, any uh like classic cartoon series like the Animaniacs, like, you know, uh, it, you, you've, everybody's heard them. Like, everybody knows Rob Paulson's voice. Even if you don't know it's him, it, you've heard it, definitely. Yeah, I would um, say... And, the and big, Jim Cummings. Yeah, I would say the big four of, I would say the big four of, um, of 90s voice actors, of 90s cartoon voice actors would probably be would probably be Jim Cummings, Rob Paulson, Tress McNeil, and uh, Maurice LaMarche. They were yep. every single everything that you could get your hand that, that you could you know glue your eyeballs to. Yes, and it, and that's and that's not a knock. That's that's not a knock on um on on, on Gail Mathia uh, on Gail Mathias or Matthias. I hope that I'm pronouncing her name right. Uh, yeah, he was um she was. She was Molly Connell. Yeah. And she was also just unbelievable because she was great to play off of them too. Because she was very much the straight man or straight yes. in like throughout the whole show, where like, you know, you have you have the you have the crazy Mr. Bumpy, which uh, you know, which delivered masterfully by Jim Cummings, and then you have you have the, you know, you have you have the more uh, subdued Squishington by, you know, also done very well by Rob Paulson and then and then Gail Matias comes in and as uh, as Molly and she kind of just like make she like acts as a medium between the two and she kind of like sets them straight when they need to be um, yes and, um Jim Cummings was also the narrator when there were narrations and he was also um he was also uh destructo and a series of other characters but they also got other Voice actors come in and do a bunch of things too. Like, uh, yeah. like they, like Mark Hamill had auditioned actually. Um, and I think maybe he pops up in a couple of episodes or like at least one episode. I'm pretty sure he is in there. I'd have to go yeah. and check the complete cast. Um, and there's an episode where, uh, Gilbert Gottfried is a, um, is a stink bug, which we'll talk about in a moment, but yeah. like it's really, really interesting how many people that they got, but they were like, you know, earlier in their careers. So you didn't, they didn't, I, I, it's like one of those things where you don't realize how special something is until you're no longer part of it. Yeah. But in the moment, like that's, that's kind of, that's kind of one of like the falls of uh, like one of the failures of like of just being a human being is that we, because time is so precious in our lives and, and, and time is so short in general that, we move that we move so quickly and we're almost always thinking about the next thing or thinking about the future so often that we really don't take enough time 
to look at the present. We're either looking at that and then we're either looking at the past or the future. And we're never, we're almost never looking into the present and realizing just yeah. how special the time, like the now actually is. And, but, you know, and when we look back on things, we'll just think, wow, that was a really fun time. Especially if you end up becoming something based on whatever you did, then that's, the, that's a whole nother thing because then you really realize like now, you know, like I, I was at a Lich King show a couple of weeks ago with, um, with our friend Mike Dre, who was the bass player in Lich King, and he's also the bass player in Condition Critical, and our other friend Sam Agnew, who um, is a is, who played on the first Condition Critical album, um, was there for the early years, and he, he plays in a few grind bands, and he's played in other thrash bands. And we were just talking about, like, we were just gushing over how special that time was of just all all of us just playing in different bands. And just like playing in different shows and just like really trying to build like some little thrash metal scene in like, you know, just in like in the middle of New Jersey. And it is really, you know, we're just doing the barbecue shows and just how much like what good times we had and how we weren't, how we didn't, how we didn't really stop to like take it all in. And now just looking back, we're just kind of like all just really proud of it. Yeah. So it's it's a lot it's it's one of those things that you really have to like it's like the Ferris Bueller uh line where um where every once in a while you should take a look around because if you um you should slow down and like you know just take into your life and I'm butchering the quote uh, cuz otherwise you could miss it. So it's, I forgot what the quote exactly yeah. is, but it's something like that. But this but this this show just the, the characters had so many layers to them and Yeah. It, yeah, and it's it's a crime that it was only on for two seasons because it was actually a very good show. The jokes were funny. Like, I I don't like. There's no real explanation why it was only on for two seasons. I guess maybe it didn't get great ratings, but I I don't know. I, I think it was pretty good and pretty funny. They had um, ordered a third season. Like there, um, it, it um, it was a change in management. From oh. from what I from what I had heard from the um, from the Ken Pontac Mr. TV um, interview, um, okay, it was just it was one of those things where where new management came in and they um, they had all these like other plans to do this thing to like they had these other plans and they were not really part of them like they were just like small potatoes and they were like they were like well. You, they were like, we have another season. Like it's written. I don't know if they shot it, but they they were like, we have a whole season ready to go. We have all of these ideas. We have all of these things that we wanted to do. And they were like, yeah, well, you know, it'll be there. It's fine. And then when they actually like came in, they were just like, and like it was time to just cut shows for either budgets to like do whatever their new things were, or to like focus on other pet projects. It like ended up get, becoming like falling closer and closer to the bottom of the list, where eventually that third season just didn't happen. Yeah, which is a shame. But you know, sometimes that's just the way that um, that's just the way that this business works. Is you know, yeah. you only like some like every show is on borrowed time, right? But you just have to wonder, you know, if are we going to have a third season? Are we going to have a fifth season? Will we even finish this pilot? Like, you know, you don't always know. But the show actually had aired. Well, the characters were actually, uh, and, and this is and this is um, possibly where Mr. Bumpy got his name because he didn't have a, he didn't really have a name when he, um, when, when, when they showed the character model um, before pitching the show and everything. Uh, the, the show aired in 1994, and it. Um, but in 1993, the three characters were showing up as um, as bumpers in between the regular programming. That um, you don't you don't always see it as much now. I mean, especially now that we have streaming services. Yeah. But that's where you would commonly see, um, for many many years, you would see like a little thing. Right before and uh, right before they cut to commercial, and as they're coming back from commercial, those were called bumpers, and you'd see it would be like just anybody from like 
a random, uh, either the same TV show that you're watching or another TV show that the channel, like, just has on it. And you would just see the characters and they would just say, or, like, just a random announce or just, like, a random, like, just, like, a random person. And it would just be, like, one of those, uh, and now a word from our sponsors or we'll be back right after these messages or yep. now back to our show or just one of those things. And it was the, and like, it was the cast, it was the Mr. Bumpy characters that yeah. would be, that would just be like, hey, kids, just stay tuned. We're, we'll be right back until, a, we'll be right back after these break, after these messages, or whatever it was. So people were already seeing those characters in 1993. And then about a year later, we actually got the show. Yeah. Which, so I'm thinking that the show is probably in development already at that point. Like, because, you know, cause, because stop motion animation takes so long to do, uh, you know, and they already had the characters established. So it was, it was they were probably filming the, the first season at that point, and they were trying to promote it by using them as bumpers, you know? I want to say that's probably what happened, but I, I don't know for sure. I mean, I'm sure, uh, like, or maybe... Or just maybe they dis or maybe they liked the pitch and they at least liked the character models enough to say, all right, well, we can use them for something. And yeah. And then eventually, over time, they ended up getting the green light to actually do the show. And yeah. Making it and then actually making it. Um, because the pilot aired. Um, the pilot aired on September tenth, nineteen ninety four, and it just it just has gotten a significant amount of like a cult following ever since. Yeah. Um, I didn't discover the show until I was in my mid to late twenties. Actually, uh, I was, I, I never had heard of this show before, before you had told me about it. Yeah. I've, I found it by accident. I was at, um, I was at this fellow crazy Sean's house, which, um, he's, which, uh, he's, 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 he's a pal of mine. I, I may have mentioned him on the show before. But uh, Crazy Sean, the um, he's the guy you want to go to when um, when there's a zombie apocalypse because he's got everything Jerry rigged. Uh, <laughs> blow, he's um, uh, it's I, I I can't give away anything directly, but uh, let's just say the man hates the government, and but he sure loves his guns. So uh, <laughs> take that take that how you will. Um, you want to be on his good side in that manner. <laughs> But, um, yeah, we were over his house doing, um, we, and, uh, we were hanging out and, um, something that was legal in Amsterdam then and is, uh, now legal in several, uh, in several states across America now was, uh, may or may not have been involved. <laughs> Some people may or may not know it as, Another um, wild green guy that lives under the bed in some, <laughs> in some households. <laughs> it may or may not have been involved through uh, one or more of the party members. And we were just trying to figure out something like what to watch. And um, and Chris Sean was like, Hey man, I actually found this the other day. Do you remember this? And he and it was like he uh, was, and he like showed me Bump of the Night, and I was like, No, I don't remember this. I remember I, I've seen these characters before. Like I've seen Mister Bumpy before. I I've seen the blue thing in the rag doll, but I don't know what the hell this is. No, like do you, uh, and he was like, Yeah, I found it on YouTube. Do you want to put it on? And I was like, Yeah, why not? And we were just cracking up at this thing. And and I I had heard about it, I had heard about it from Rob Paulson's Talking Tunes podcast, um, one of the earlier episodes when um when, when he had Jim Cummings on, and they were talking about the show. Yeah. And I, you know, I had and I, and so like later on when like when 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 um like this was like maybe a week or two later when when I had actually like seen the actual thing at Crazy Sean's out just by happenstance that he had found this um that he had found it on youtube so the name was at least fresh in my mind and i knew who i knew who like who had voiced the characters but i had no idea that like i had no idea of the actual show or the nature of the characters yeah also um 
when like when they were showing the character models to the network uh they um they the he hit um Ken Pontact asked them about uh, like legal or whatever and he asked the the, the um, executives about Squishington and he was like hey we were thinking about um his friend being like you know, another like little like glob of um, a little like glob of uh, of like goo or liquid that lives in um that lives in the bathroom. And he lives in the toilet, and they were like, and he was like, "Is that going to be a problem?" And they were like, "Well, just don't make him brown." And he was like, "Okay, that's good." Um, but Molly um, Molly Cottle actually had come about at the suggestion of the network because they. Um, they they were pushing for a female character because they were like, well, you have two male characters, but like we need to like need to reach the female child. We, we need to reach like little girls too. Yeah, so we should have like we should have a strong like female character, and they agreed. But they and but they didn't really know how to write her because like they were because like you know they were nerds and they just didn't really know any girls growing up. Like they didn't have any like friends who were girls or like sisters really or anything. So yeah, they didn't really know like how girls are supposed to be or whatever. So they just like, they just wrote her like how they would like, if they just wanted another friend, what they'd like that friend to be because, um, Ken and, uh, Ken and David, they, um, like bumpy and squishy are like very much parts of them. So, yeah. so, they, so they, so that's really like how that had come to be. It was like it was like Bumpy was an extension of Ken, and uh, and like Squishington is more of an extension of David Blyman. And they were just like, well, if we had a friend who was a girl, what would we want her to be? Like, uh-huh. that's where they wrote Molly, and they couldn't have done it any better. And that goes to show you in the writing on how well she plays off of the other characters. Yeah. So it's it's really like it's really a show about friendship. But it's so much more because there's a whole, there was, a, it was a very progressive show in the writing as well. And they may not, and I don't think that there were any intentions in the writer's room. Like now, of course, you know, because you have like a whole lot of like woke writing rooms and like TV shows that like want to throw in like agendas and all this other things. Yeah. They want to like do too many, they, they want to like throw in too much where mm-hmm. like, it's like you do understand it. Like at the end of the day, people will watch the show not because of, not because of your political stance or anything that you're like conveying. They're like sure, some people will, but most people just want to watch this as a distraction from you know whatever crap they're going through in their regular life, or just to like turn their brain off. So, right. You know, it's like most people just want to get away from that. So like be so like if you're writing to like for the sake of being progressive, it's not going to work. But if you're just writing because you thought this might be funny or you thought that this might be cool to put in a show, then it'll probably land a lot better. Um, but like a lot like um like there's several moments in the show where um where Bumpy's sexuality like is you know it's like it's just he's very like fluid about his sexuality and like and he's very open and he's very and he he's he's const- he's exploring the show like it, he's exploring his his sexuality in various episodes where like and nobody cares like none of the characters say like uh, like like I'll, I'll give you two examples um one of them is um one of them is the episode um where Gilbert Gottfried is um uh, is the stink bug like I mentioned earlier, and the episode is called Love Stink. You can find that. And it's, um, and it starts off where, um, where Bumpy and Molly are, uh, they're, they're trash fishing. Like they're, they're sitting over like the ledge in the kitchen or whatever. And they're, um, they're, they're, they're fishing into the, gar- like they're throwing a fishing reel into like the, gar- into the garbage bin. And they're just pulling up trash because like Mr. Bumpy eats, his favorite food is just, like dirty socks for whatever reason he like that's his that's his thing he he likes eating dirty socks and just really like dirty laundry in general is just his delicacy of choice and they're in the trash and he's going and he's like looking for a snack or whatever he's looking to and like Molly's never really fished before so he's showing her how to fish and um and Molly falls into the trash 
and she gets out and obviously she needs to she needs to like get she needs to wash herself and get clean so she's like oh, okay i'm going to go i'm going to go take a shower now or something and she walks by this plant and the smell attracts the stink bug and the stink bug it like falls head over heels for molly and like but because he smells too she's really not interested so she's like sorry we could be friends i got to clean i, I got to go get clean cuz i smell bad but she still kind of likes him, like romantically, and she go- and like he's trying to woo her, and he wins her over eventually. And she's like, "Oh, what a sweet guy! Like, I guess I shouldn't. Uh, I could. I, I guess I can get past the smell. Like, he's re- he seems really charming and everything, which that's really cool. First of all, but secondly, Bumpy is eating trash and." Uh, uh, he's eating trash and he's eating like toenail clippings while Molly's like, you know, just like freshening up mm-hmm. and the bug and like the stink bug walks in. Uh, I think his name is, um, it's like odorous something or other. And they just call him Odie for short. And Odie walks into the, he barges into her, into her, in, like in, under the bed. And he's like, he like brings her like flowers and chocolates or whatever. And he's like, He's like, Molly, I love you. You're my true love and whatever, ha- and w- what have you. And the smell of Bumpy's breath from the food, he's eating toenail clippings and like some other disgusting thing. Um, it's in like a potato chip like bag, which is kind of funny. And because Molly is all clean and she like smells good, the bug's not really attracted to her, but the bug is now... The bug, which is a male bug, is attracted to Bumpy now, Uh and he's attracted to the smell, which, you know, is just pansexuality, bisexuality, whatever you want to call it, where it doesn't matter, where, like, I I just want the best of everything, Um, and he's more attracted to the smell than, like, 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 he doesn't care about the genders, and Bumpy also doesn't care that the bug is into him. The bump because like Bumpy is like charmed by the bug too. So Bumpy is now interested in the bug and Molly's a little bit jealous. And Molly and and like Molly and Bumpy start to like kind of fight over the affection of the bug. And nobody and like nobody cares. Like you would think, especially in 1994, that that like this would be a gag where, where like, to, to, like, to, like, where, like, the gag would be to, like, kind of be, like, you know, just, like, homophobic or transphobic or anything. Like, you would think that back in that time, like, because you would see it on a regular basis in regular cartoons or anything that, like, yeah. where, like, any time a guy came onto another guy, it was like, oh, get away from me, or, oh, my God, he's, like... It, he's he's horny. What do I do? And like just this like very like you'd see a lot of these very distasteful like stereotypes. And in 1994, on this children's show where you would think that this would happen, nobody cares, and they're like totally into it, and they're just like, and they're both and like both of them are fighting over this bug, and the bug, funnily enough, the bug does not want to share that the the bug does not want to be shared. Yeah. The bug storms off because the bug is annoyed because the bug is like, I'm not an object. I, I, I have feelings. So the and the and the bug and like Bumpy and it's just funny that they're both attracted to the bug and the bug is also attracted to both of them, but the bug doesn't want to have to choose and they don't want the other and they both want the bug. So they're willing to compromise and be in a throuple. This is 94. Again, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. This is almost twenty years ago. Well, I think you see the the, the difference between twenty years ago, like you know, and now is that like now it's like it's like <clears throat> I'm trying to think of like a way to put it. Like, there's a lot more awareness now. Well, it's like the thing is that there's with, a lot like, more awareness and acceptance. Where then you. <clears throat> You well, no, what I'm saying is, like, I don't, I don't think people cared as much back then about any of this. Like, like I don't think it was, like, like that controversial. People probably just saw it as, like, a, a comedic thing. 
Whereas now, like, it's, like, kind of, like, shoved in everybody's face so much that, like, it becomes a controversy, you know? You know what I'm saying? Like, someone makes it into a controversy, in other words, now. Whereas back then, they would just, like, laugh it off as, like, a, you know, it's like, oh, okay, it's a funny kind of a joke, you know? You look at something like, uh, like, uh, the Seinfeld episode, where, like, uh, George and Jerry get outed, even though they're not even in the closet right, you know and then right. like and and the big jokes that they keep saying is like we're not gay not that there's anything wrong with that you know and that was like the yeah. 90s so it was like you know that was like i guess kind of controversial for like or, you know what you would think was controversial but like you know looking back it really wasn't that bad and it was funny and it worked and it was not offensive like it was a funny way to like kind of play off like you know, like two guys that are kind of like insecure about being like, you know, seen as homosexual, but like in a funny way that's not offensive, you know, and like, but nobody like it wasn't like a big stink. No one made a big deal about it back then. So it was like it worked, you know, if something like that today, people would make a huge stink about it or well, like, you know, people either either someone the, on the it, far. Well, it's the Twitter going, check marks. That, that's yeah, who it is. That's basically and, you know, what it is. It's either someone on the far right or someone on the far left gets pissed off. Like, someone on the far right thinks it's like, oh my god, the culture is being destroyed by, like, you know, neo-Marxists or whatever. And then someone on the far left says, oh my god, this is offensive and making fun of gay people. And it's like, it, neither of those things is true. But, you know, like, you know, that's – unfortunately, Twitter is just like – there's only extremes now. You can't have, like, any kind of opinion in the middle anymore. Right. I mean, and also it's not helped that like this is what a lot this is what gets clicked. So a lot of the media compromises its um, itself, yes. you know, just to cater to this and make it seem like this is yes. It blows it. It makes excuse me. It makes it a mountain. It makes a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah, outrage equals money. But nowadays, yeah, because that's what it is. Um, yeah, but I but like I just think I just find that it was just so interesting that. They did it that way, and like while I, while, while you and I don't necessarily think that a lot of, like a, a lot of like a lot of that humor was like terribly, terribly offensive, depending on what it was. Like I will say one that I, that I think is pretty bad and has aged pretty terribly, like most comedy does, is um is Ace Ventura. How like the whole punchline was something transphobic, where like. It's like, yeah, I like, like, would this fly today? No, but for whatever reason, it flew then, and like, we would no longer do that today. And I think enough of us are like grown adults to understand that that wouldn't happen. Um, yeah, but but you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm surprised that um, I'm surprised that like people haven't gone after it that like like that. But that's it's just one of those things. Where, well, I mean, people have. That's it's, no, I'm sure they have. Accused of being you know, uh, you know, the thing is, is that like in that situation was like was was fucking Ray Finkel actually like a transgender person or was it just like did he just like take the opportunity to murder this hiker or whatever and then take her identity and become her so he could like get close to Dan Marino, you know, like was he actually, you know, so that's like, you know, whatever. It's a debate for another day. Like, but like, yeah, that's. I think the thing is that you can't like take stuff out of context of like well, the, you know, and that's the problem that's is that everyone the main wants to problem take is right. everybody will take everything out of context specifically to say, oh well, look at how bad this is, right? And that's the problem with fit, social media it'll is that it'll fit the narrative that way, right? Well, that's the problem with social media is that it's nothing but taking things out of context because people will see like a friggin' like five second clip of someone saying something. And, like, immediately say, oh, look, they said something offensive, and they're a terrible person. And, like, not knowing that they, like, if you actually watch the full, like, five-minute clip, it's not offensive at all. And it's, like, completely not what the person was saying. But, you know, that that's just not how things fly anymore. Everyone wants little, like, quick, like, five-second blurbs about stuff. Not, like, actual, like, they don't actually want to sit and watch the video. You know, right. I think they've done they've done studies of like the amount of people that actually read art news articles or just like look at the the title and just assume what the article's about based on the title and it's like it's like staggeringly high of people that don't actually read the article. They just see the title and repost it and say like, "Oh, I didn't actually read it, but this this title this makes me mad." You that's know? if they say that's if they admit to not actually reading it. Right. Which anyway, my point was that 
Um, my original point was that while a lot of other shows was uh, while it was a lot more the norm in like the nineties to kind of like use it as a gag or like to say, Oh, what are you doing? Like, like, what are you doing? Like, just like, are, are you like, like, do you don't like, like you'd see something like you don't like boys, do you? Or like, or like one of those things. And though, like it still hurt people. It's yeah. people still, did get upset, and you know, if you are part of that community, then you were ever you had every right to be upset about something like that because it does feel like a, it would feel like a personal attack in anything that you fought, like in anything that you see that does you know bother you specifically. It does almost feel like a personal attack with anything that it is, and even though it's not, and the intention in most cases is not to is was not to upset you. And I'm sure if you actually had a face-to-face -face conversation with the person and said, oh, this really, uh, like, this thing that you did on the TV show that, you know, barring uh, it being a professional stand-up comedian who their, their, their jokes are just designed to either hit or miss, they weren't designed specifically with you in mind, similar to the show, where a comedian might just say, well, I'm not going to not tell the joke tomorrow when i don't see you versus yeah. versus somebody where this is a show that's that will potentially have reruns and everything so there is a lot more of the onus on them to to acknowledge that because this is it's not go it's not that like for the most part this will be unchanged and continue to air where like i'm sure if you i'm sure if you spoke to most people to most writers and said hey what you wrote in that episode of I don't know, let me just throw in a random cartoon of um, Men in Black, the animated series, which would be cool to do an episode on that anyway. Um, yeah. I didn't like what, I, I didn't like that joke that you, that was in this episode of the of, um, of Men in Black, the animated series. I, like, it really upset me as, you know, whatever. I'm sure that they would feel very terrible and they would apologize profusely and they would, you know, try to do something to make it right. So, like, just because they wrote something, it doesn't mean that they're a bad person. It just means they made probably not the best decision at the time, and they didn't realize what the ramifications could be. Which I, th well, I think I think most people understand that. Well, people also need to, like, just have a little bit thicker skin and realize that, like, if there's a joke about something on TV, it doesn't necessarily mean they're attacking you personally, you know? No, they don't, I, know, who, they, they don't know you even exist. Right. So that's that's another thing is that like people like will just people look for things to be offended by, and uh, it's kind of like a, a you know a, a symptom of of living in the times we live in because you know we don't have to like struggle or worry about like you know oh you know you, you know you think about people like a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago where like you know you had to worry about getting like food on the table you know because like. You know, there there was no grocery store. You had to like fucking go out and like either hunt or like work in a factory or some shit. So you didn't have time to be like to think about this shit and get offended about every little thing. You know, so you know we live in a society that's very advanced and like we're very comfortable. So you know, what do we do to occupy our time? Oh, well, let's just find things to complain about and and like get offended by now. Right. You know? I I there's there's been studies on how often. People on how often conversation and just interact human interaction is spent complaining, and it's also a significant number that like most conversation of like of human life revolves around complaining. Yeah, well, especially you know, like in the Western world, you know, where like there, there really is no reason for us to complain. Like we like fucking live in like a pretty. Uh, I arguably the best time in history to be alive because like you know you, you know people don't like overwhelmingly die in childbirth you know there's not like a rampant disease and like you know like people only live until like they're 50 because like they fucking get killed by you know whatever they get killed in their work they get killed by some kind of disease or something like that you know we have like access to the internet we can watch any tv show we have access to food and clean water like it's it's the best time in human history yes. to be alive with the exception if you, of the with the exception of a pandemic we just went through where many which is a minor pandemic past. compared to ones of the past though 
it, it like compared to like past pandemics, we actually lucked out with COVID. Like it wasn't really that bad comparably. Like if you look at something like the Spanish flu, which killed like you know like ten times the amount of people of COVID, uh, or or like the bubonic plague that literally wiped out like a third of the population of Europe. You know. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, basically my point is, like, we don't really have anything we should be complaining about. We have life pretty good, but, like, people will still find things to complain about, you know? Well, of course. I mean, I think that's just in, that that's just in our nature. Yeah. I, I don't think there's anything you can do about, um... Well, it's like, you know, the whole, like, oh, first, first world problems, like, the phrase comes yes, from, you know? Yes, very much. A lot of these things are first world problems, not to say that they yeah. don't still have a homeless issue, which we shouldn't even have. We have an, yeah. more than enough food to cover every person on this planet, and for whatever reason, it's just not going to everyone, and I don't understand it. Also, you know, like, this is a topic and a debate for another day, but... You know, billionaires and oligarchs and what ha- and uh, oligarchs, excuse me, have you know they they and they need to actually be doing what they keep suggesting that other people and world leaders should be doing. It's like, yeah, it's one thing, and, and like I understand you don't if you give it to a charity, you don't know where all the money's going, and they're not going to tell you. But that's a cop out. Well, if you're a, bull, really, a multi-billionaire, you, you can really just wanted, you can set up your own charity. You have right. the money to do it, and then just fucking like do it yourself, basically, because then you know where the money's going. Right. That's the, like like that. That's why that's a that, that's why that's a false argument. Where like yeah. you can literally change the world for the better by snapping your fingers, basically, and you'll get it done because you have the resources and you also like. I don't talk to billionaires. I'm not friends with billionaires because billionaires don't want to talk to me. I'm not another billionaire. So yeah. like you can so like if you don't have enough resources, you can talk to maybe one other friend or two other or like and they'll do it too. And like if you can get enough people to get in, which you probably can, because like what's another hundred million like to a billionaire? You could absolutely change this world for the better overnight. And there's and there's countless ways that you can do that, and they keep passing the buck to everybody else, and they keep saying, "Oh well, you know, world leaders should do this, and world and and um, you know, billionaires should do that, or oh, we should absolutely be tax higher." And it's like, yeah, you say that, but you're but what you're actually doing in practice is skirting the issue. And, you know, and, and you're not, and you're still not, you're like, you're taking advantages of loopholes that if you really cared, you would not be doing that. So like every, so like every, every time somebody like, every time somebody puts up an article about, oh, look at how great this per like, look at how great this wealthy individual is. It's like, no, cause they could, they could do more. They could actually do what they keep saying that somebody else should do. Like, yeah. like, come on. A- anyway, we've we've gone pretty far off the rails. What I was get, what, yes. was uh, what initially had started this was how progressive uh, Bump in the Night actually was for its time, and um, it took a long time for a lot of the rest of TV to catch up with that. I'm not saying that they were the only ones doing something like this in um, in '94 of like having progressive messaging and just having you know. Like, just not care. It's just like loving your friends for who they are, which was really the core of the show. Is just yeah. It's like there, there's all these characters, and everybody loves each other for who they are. You know, they might not like certain things about each other, but they, but at the end of the day, they're all friends, and they don't care. Like, there's another episode where, um, where, um, I think it's called um the Prince of um the Prince of Squishington Bowl or something like that. It's, um, they were like, were like, um, they're climbing the, um, they're, they're like climbing the toilet as if it's Mount Everest. And, um, and Mr. Bumpy gets to the top and, um, and Squishington is like, he, he can't quite keep up to get to the top. And, um, Mr. Bumpy ends up like falling into the toilet and like, 
you know, and Squishy can accidentally flushes him and he comes out through the drain. Don't ask me how that happened, like through, through the, uh, through the sink faucets. Don't, don't ask me what the piping situation is in this person's house. Like, I shudder to think. What- in the words of George Costanza, it's all pipes. What's the difference? <laughs> yes. I shudder to think at what happens during a traditional bathroom break for one of the, for one of the family members. Well, if the toilet is connected to the sink, that's not a, they're going to have a bad time. <laughs> the plumber must be making a killing in that household. Yeah. Of that family. Anyway, so he gets sent in, so he gets flushed down the toilet, and then, um, and Squishy feels terrible, even though Bumpy's totally fine. He's like, he's like, he's like, don't worry about it. Like, I'm totally fine. It's like, like it's all good. Like let like let's go like let's go get something to eat or like something like that. And Squishy feels terrible. He's like, I let him down. I could have saved him. I could have helped him. I could have stopped him from getting flushed on the toilet. And he beats himself up about it, and he feels horrible. And um, and Bumpy comes, and um, I think Bumpy or like Molly is reading his story. No, um, Bumpy and Molly walk in on the children, and like um, the older brother reading to the um reading a bedtime story to the sister about the, uh, the frog prince and, um, and how like the frog prince become and how the frog gets kissed. He becomes a, by a princess, he becomes a prince and the frog, you know, and like everything. And like the, as a prince, he's like, you know, he's a lot more confident now, whatever. And, you know, he's, he's, you know, he, he just like blossoms into this, you know, in, into, you know, into, into the best version of himself and the um and what you've got there and uh, and and um bumpy and molly over here and they're like oh man we've got to do this like we like we have to like we've got to get squishy's confidence back like we've got to help we got to make him feel better because like he's upset we don't want to make like, how do we get him to feel better and they and they get like an aha moment and he, they're like i know We'll get some. We'll get someone to give him a kiss, like that'll boost his confidence. And um, and so they tell Squishington that he needs to become a prince, and the only way that he can do that is to kiss a princess. And there's like these Barbie dolls that they have too, and they're and they're like um, they're called like um something. They're called like princess dolls or something of that nature. So they're like, oh well, we know some princesses, so. They're like trying to convince these girls to kiss Squishington, and they don't want to do it because he's a toilet uh, glob and he like he smells funny. So they're like not real. So like because he smells bad, they're not interested in him, and this makes Squishington feel worse. And they're like, and Bumpy's like, I'm gonna get him to have. A, I'm, I'm gonna get him a kiss from a princess, even if it's the last thing I do. So he tries all these elaborate like things, and there's and um like he actually dresses him up as a prince. He gets a fake limo, and he like. Tells them that he's a that like they can become a princess if they if they give him a kiss and they go to kiss him and they realize that it's not him after they mob him and like there's a funny line um, that Swissington says where he's like now I know how Charles feels which like you know obviously Prince Charles the royal family at the time so it's just funny um, and but he still feels bad that he can't get a princess to kiss him so Bumpy borrows um so like bumpy and molly decide that they're just gonna dress bumpy up as a they're just gonna dress bumpy up as a girl and he's gonna just take the bullet and give him a like give his friend a kiss to restore his confidence so and um and while she's dressing him up in you know in like in girls clothes she asks him she's he's like she's and um, he's like, he's like, honestly, he's like, what do you think? Like, he's like, do you think I could pull this off? And she's like, honestly, I think you look beautiful. She's like, how do you feel? Like, she's she's like, how do you feel this? He's like, because he's like complaining about the um, he's complaining about the corset uh, that apparently she's put on him. He's like wearing a dress already, so you can't see it, but he's obviously slimmer because um, he's got a big old pot belly <laughs> and. She's like, well, how do you, she's like, she's like, well, how do you feel? And he's like, honestly, I really like, she's like, honestly, I feel really comfortable in these clothes. I really enjoy exploring my feminine side. This is like, this is great. And, and if I, re- and if you think I really, he's, he's like, he's like, I've really, he's like, I feel more confident and I feel beautiful. 
And it's like, and he's embracing it. And he does eventually give Squishington the kiss. And Squishington doesn't notice that it's bumpy for some reason. Um, and Squishington is like, oh man, I'm a prince now. I can do anything. And he ends up saving, uh, and like something happens with Bumpy and he ends up saving him. Um, and, uh, and then of course the dress comes off and he's like, Bumpy, it was you. And he was and like, instead of being like, oh my God, what are you doing? Like you'd expect him to do. He's like, Bumpy, that was you. And he's like, yeah, he's like, but guess what? You saved me, and you didn't, and so he's like, am I still a prince? He's like, well, you were never a prince, but you always had the courage to save me, to, you always had the courage to be brave, so, and you saved me. So, like, redeem, so, like, Squishington redeems himself, and he doesn't even question what just happened. He's like, that's, he's like, that was just such a nice thing for you to do. Like, that's, like, another, so, that, like, that was just, like, a whole other thing where, like, the whole point is you love your friends, warts and all, and you don't care, like, like, well, you don't care what they're, like, you know, whatever they're like or anything like that. You don't, like, you don't judge them. Like, you just have a good, like, just, like, your friends are great. Like, there's a, like, like, the reason you like your friends is because you like your friends. It doesn't matter about anything else. Yeah. So, like, that, like, it, there's, like, a whole, there, there was, like, a whole wholesome vibe to it that I really enjoyed. I think a lot of people appreciate uh, when, when they go back and watch this. Yeah. Well, especially because they're like monsters, you know, it's like, uh, you know, you would think, oh, they're supposed to be scary or like ugly or whatever, but like, they're really like good, you know, they're good and wholesome, you know, it's not like, so it's kind of like, you know, like don't judge a book by its cover to, you know, yeah. thrown in with that. And I mean, there is one monster that's particularly grouchy. Um, like not nothing, and I don't particularly mean Destructo because Destructo, while he doesn't really like Bumpy, you know, he doesn't like he doesn't hate everything. He just doesn't like him because he's a rule breaker and he's wild. Yeah, but he like otherwise would probably get along with him. Um, yeah, it's but uh, they they do have a closet monster, which is basically a laundry basket turned upside down and. It's like yelling and like screaming and like uh, all the time. And it's like this big, and it's just like laundry that's just like, you know, creates a face and everything. And it's kind of cool. And it like growls and stuff. And like there's an episode where Molly is just like, she tames the beast by like comforting him. And then Bumpy, because Bumpy thinks that it's like, you know, dangerous. And then it's like a menace. He like tries, he inadvertently sabotages it. And then Molly calms it down. Yeah. So, like, it's like another like underlying message is there's some there's good in everybody, which I also liked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the show also had a very big musical talk, um, vibe to it, which um, the original composer only stuck on for the first season, and then um, the second season, the like more of the right more of the songwriting fell on Ken. Uh, yeah. Contact and. <clears throat> And had never really written musical numbers before, and he didn't realize how much he loved it until he started doing it. And he said in interviews, "My like after that, my dream job became to just write show tunes like for children's shows all day and just collect yeah. royalties. If I could just do that for a living, that would be amazing." But the um they had they had they had something called like the um just like the um the uh they had like something called like a karaoke or something um at the end of every episode where they it was like the um the kitty karaoke or something of that nature where like it was just under the bed just like there was a different musical number that was uh, based around whatever the um whatever the previous episode was about so they um. So there was just so like it was another way to reinforce whatever the real message of the um of, of the, the of the episode was, and it was very catchy show tunes and everything, and it, it was really neat. Like one of them was uh, like the one that a lot of people stand out the most, and I've um, I've actually given my fiance permission to uh, to uh, play it in in the house under the right circumstances. <laughs> is the uh, I was right and you were wrong song. 
where it's just um, where they're just we're bumpy and squishy or having civil disagreements over my new things and um, and the uh, and one of them is, like one of them is just like um, uh, it's like um, penguins only live at the zoo and then um, and like they're arguing about that not in you know in a civil way just like no, they don't. Yes, they do. No, they don't. Yes, they do. And then Bumpy's like, well, I have, he's like, well, I have a penguin living in the bathroom. And he's like, oh, wow, penguins don't only live at the zoo. And then the chorus is just like, I was right and you were wrong. I'm going to sing the I was right song. Yeah. And it's actually really, it's actually really cute and a pretty funny song. Um <laughs> So I think if you, I think if you show your, um, I think if you show uh, your, your 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 son the, uh, the 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 song and like even you know even your um, even your lady that uh, they would get a kick out of it and they, and um, at least one of them will probably start singing it shortly after. It, <laughs> like it is very catchy. Yeah, uh, it was like the musical numbers was uh, another thing that the uh, the network had pushed, which. Like in most cases, the network doesn't know what they're talking about. But I think in this particular era, ABC was like they they were very much in touch with what was going on, and they uh, and, yeah. and they had like very good hunches and to uh, to push on this show, and it was just really it like it really added another layer to the show that a lot of people have become fans of and it's sad because that that they didn't get a third season because there were a lot of um there were a lot of different ideas that they had going for the third season like they were planning on introducing other characters um there was going to be uh another arc where um where i think squishy had like found a, a significant other or molly had um and there was going to be, you know, there, there was just going to be a whole other thing. But they also had music, like basically a whole album's worth of music that we'll probably never see the light of day. But I hope that, I hope that possibly, like hopefully this podcast will help. And hopefully a few other people will discover it and there'll be some sort of a clamoring for a third season. Because I think yeah. they did it on Adult Swim or... Any streaming service, like even Disney Plus, could just like pick it back up if they just want to add or reboot another show. Honestly, back you know, I think back when it was first on, if it had run on like a network like Nickelodeon, it probably would have done better because then it probably, or like if it was even in syndication on Nickelodeon, they probably would have had more demand for uh for for a third season. Uh, you know, because if I I think you know being only on. ABC one day a week because ABC is like cartoon morning or most show is only on Saturday mornings. So, you know, right. they would only show Mr. Bumpy once a week on Saturday mornings. So you didn't have that, you know, that benefit of having reruns during the week for kids that necessar weren't necessarily home on Saturday mornings watching cartoons, you know? Um, right. Oh, the uh, conductor's name was Jim Latham, by the way, for the first season. Okay. Yeah, composer. So I think if it was on Nickelodeon or something, it probably would have done better, and they probably would have continued with it because it would have had the advantage of having you know reruns during the week. I think so too, because you know, like I said earlier, the dynamic of like the fan base of this show is either I I, I know what this is and I love it, or I don't know what this is at all. So I, oh, I was in that. You know, group. I've never heard of this show before, and, and then I watched it, and I was like, "Wow, this is actually a really good show." I'm surprised it didn't do better than it did. It didn't go for more seasons because it was it was funny. Uh, you know, it had that like classic like cartoon feel to it. Um, you know, the the casting was really good. Like it, the animation was great. It was just it was really good all around. Uh, so I'm like really surprised that it it wasn't you know it didn't continue on and become like a, a classic. Yeah, uh, but I, I think because more people are discovering it now that well, I, I would like to think that more people are discovering it now as like as we uh, 
part of this weird thing for the last few years has just been constant nostalgia probably yeah. the last decade or so. So more people are discovering this and you know like we've said on previous episodes like SWAT Cats and everything, people who are discovering these shows are people who would have watched it as children because it's just us growing up basically. And yeah. because we have YouTube and streaming services and other things we can well, I think find all of these older things that before like may if like you were lucky if this even came out on dvd because that would be the only way to really get it or on vhs and if you didn't have those old tapes or anything then it was gone forever because it would be like at the beck and call of the network as to whether or not it would ever get found where yeah. now that's not the case because obviously somebody had this had you know had this medium and they uploaded it to YouTube for free or whatever or they put it on another website or something and like other people found it or other people remembered it and they shared it with their friends which you know just like hey man I found bump in the night what the hell is that oh you gotta yeah. watch this like just very similar to what this how this episode transpired and i think i think i think at some point in time i mean anything is possible if swat cats can well swat cats is getting remade i think we mentioned that a couple of episodes ago yes exactly the, they are making a new swat cat series so and i i would say that bump in the night was would be even better candidate for for a remake or like a new season of cuz how, how good of a show would, it was. Yes, I would love to see it. And I would love to see it introduced to a whole new generation of kids. Yeah. Um, I like, you know, I have, I have future nephews in law and, uh, and, and nieces. They're not, they're technically not my nieces and nephews yet, but they will be in, like by the end of the year. Uh, yeah. But I'm, you know, and I would love to see, I would love to be the I would love to be the one to introduce them to them or like just to see just to like go over one day and you know there's and there's one of them just like singing and dancing to the um to, to the bump in the night theme song which is very catchy by the way it's yeah it's 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 like a heartbreak hotel but if little Richard wrote it that's kind of like the best way that I can describe it I love that. Like I, I really, I really love, I really adore that theme song, and it's become one of my favorite theme songs very quickly, just from like rewatching it over this past week. Uh -huh. But I would absolutely love to see this. Um, yeah, it would be, it would be a really great thing, I think, for a new generation of kids. So hopefully, yeah. and, <clears throat> and, Ken, and Ken Pontac has said too that like Adult Swim would just love this. Yes. If they ever like if they like if there was a show for them to gobble up, this is one of them. Yeah. But I I think that's the show. This is all that's all I've got. I love this show and I yeah. think it's actually like I think it's I think it definitely holds up and it actually resonates even better now in the current time. I think more people yeah. that see this now would appreciate it. Yeah. No, it's it's definitely a good show, uh, and it, you know it really was ahead of its time, and uh, would it, you know it deserves to uh, have like some kind of reboot or or you know new season, uh, and it would be I think it'd be appreciated now. Yeah, I think you know, I think a renaissance for uh, for Mister Bumpy definitely needs to happen. Yeah. But if we've got nothing else to add, I think we can ride off into the sunset and wrap it up now. All right. But thank you, each and every one of you, for sticking around and listening to the show, listening to our tangents. And I hope that if you, I hope that you love this show as much as we do. And if you love it, and if not more, and Ken and David, if you're listening to this somehow in digital media device land. We would absolutely love to have you on the show. Why does this exist? Show at gmail dot com. If you want to, uh, if you want to find us, or you can even just like reach out to us on Facebook. 
facebook.com slash why does this exist uh or any uh, any way that you can we would we would love to have you on the show and just have both of you talk about this or one of you who like but it was it would be it would be a real it would be our honor to just speak with you and just get a little more detail on this but and if you've stuck around we really appreciate it if you're watching this, if you're looking at this on youtube Feel free to like, comment, subscribe. I know we got off to a little uh, bumpy start. No pun intended. No pun very much intended. Um, but have we got where we needed to go. And I hope that we've provided you with enough information. And um, if we haven't, let us know. We'll say, hey, you forgot to talk about this. Or tell us about what your favorite episode of Bump of the Night is or your favorite Bump of the Night song. I would absolutely love to hear it. Tell us either by emailing us at why does this exist show at gmail.com signing up to our patreon patreon.com slash why does this exist and then telling us in our discord server if you really feel like spending the extra uh scurl or if you just want to go to youtube liking uh, like liking commenting and subscribing and just telling us in the comments section what your favorite bump in the night anything was um and if you don't like us and tell us we're a disgrace to humanity, and that we should be flogged in with a with with reeds and and tied in a burlap sack and thrown in a river somewhere. But and not 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 to kill us, but a shallow river that we can escape. And the bag is does not have a knot on it, and if it does, if it is not, it is a very loose knot that we could crawl out of. And we will eventually, and we'll figure out what we did wrong, and we will be better. So, hopefully not the hopefully not the East River because that's just disgusting. Oh <laughs> no, not the East River. We'll give raw sewage. We'll become Squishingtons. But any closing statements? Sir? Uh no, no. I think uh, I think that's about it. I think we're we're covered. All right. Well, that has been. Why does this exist? We hope that you. Go a hundred miles an hour and go bump in the night. Um, I've been Chris, and I've been Rob. And remember, question everything. Good night, everybody. <laughs>